was at a Sheva Brachas once, and finding a good Sheva Brachas speaker is a rarity. You know, sometimes you get one of these guys who wants to give a long pilpul to the one Rav who's sitting there. Well, everybody else is spacing out. He goes on for like 25 minutes, and the Rav is nodding. He doesn't know what he's saying either, but he's just nodding along, you know. Well, people come and say all kinds of things. So this guy gets up once, and he says, I came to the Chassanah, and someone asked me, are you from the side of the Chassan or the Kala? And I said, neither. I'm from the opposition, because I oppose this shidduch. Well, that certainly got everyone's attention, and he meant it. <laughs> he says, I thought this was a terrible idea. You know, and I advise each one of them that they should break it off, you know. And Baruch Hashem, when he reached the end, he decided it was a good idea after all. But um, I want you to understand this. This is extremely important. It's all over. The world is over. Everything that you know no longer applies. And I, I will prove this to you in a simple way. If you want to read a horrible book, there are three books in the series, each one more horrible perhaps than the one before. Yeah, it's by a, a guy named David Peltzer who was one of the worst child abuse cases in America. The first one is called A Child Called It. The second one is called Lost Boy. The third one is called Man Named Dave. And his mother gassed him, stabbed him, starved him, beat him. You know, what she didn't do to this kid burnt him. And in the third book, he has his own teenage kid. And the teenager says, Dad, why did you let her do this to you? Now, you have to understand, this kid is younger than me. And he said, because when I was growing up, there was one thing a child never said to a parent. You never said no. When my parents told me something, it wasn't an option to say no. Of course you never said no. You did whatever they told you because they were your parents. That was understood. You know, if they weren't looking, you could mumble under your breath. <laughs> what were you saying? Nothing. <laughs> but you did it because that's what it was. You did whatever you were supposed to do. Today, I could tell my kids something, and they look at me and say, no. I was like, what? No, I'm not going to. And if you don't like it, you can throw me out. I've got places to go. <laughs> and all the chinuch experts today say, oh, it's very true. You know, you can't say anything to your kids. So now my kids mouth off to me, and I still mumble to myself <laughs> when they're not looking. You know? Otherwise, they say, what would you say? No, they don't. I stopped talking in my house years ago. I walk in now, you know, I could walk into the room and one of my kids says, what? I said, I didn't say anything. I saw you looking. <laughs> so I walk in and I'm like, doing doing So all of Chinuch, you read any Sefer on Chinuch, is all based on the following principle. There are the parents and there are the children. And the parents tell the children what to do and the children do it. That's gone. So now every book on Chinuch is worthless. Because the assumptions of which society was based upon are gone. Yeah? And in general, everything that society is based upon no longer exists. Now, when it comes to marriage, it is completely obvious. Okay? I will I'll quote the line from uh, my friend, Dr. Ivan Lerner. He's a psychiatrist. He's a friend of mine. It's not professional. It's just, we're just friends. Anyway, so... <laughs> He said to me, when I told my father I was going to become a psychiatrist, he said, if you're going to spend all that time already, why don't you become a real doctor? So he says, because I think I can help people. He says, people are going to pay you for this? He says, yeah. He says, when I was growing up, people were too busy making a living to be crazy. And that's what it was. People were too busy trying to build a world. My parents' generation, which is for most of you, your grandparents' generation, you know, my father was born in 1925, my mother 1928, you know. My father lived through the Depression. He dropped out of school to be able to help support his family because there was no food to eat. He had to teach himself English because his, his father never learned English. He spoke Yiddish his whole life. And you built a business and you built a home and you got married and you took care of your kids because that's what you were supposed to do. And everybody got married because everybody got married. And you built your home. And nobody was perfect. My father? Compared to my father, I'm a saint. But my kids are sure that I should be taken away by social services. You know what I mean? Because I looked at them the wrong way. You know what I mean? 
My father's only educational technique was to take off his belt and beat me. That was, that was called chinuch back then, you know? And, uh, and, and, you know, that was all he knew because his father was a real tough guy. He wasn't like my dad. He, my dad was pretty easygoing. But, uh, you know, but there was, there was this attitude of you have to do what you have to do, you know? And I had chores when I was growing up. Not because we made a list and there were chores and if you did your chores you'd get an allowance and then you could save up and you could buy something with it. You did chores because you were part of the family and everybody in the family had to do chores and everybody worked together. Today the cleaning girl comes, the teenagers all sitting on the couch with their phones and she's like, uh, could you move so I could vacuum here? And they're like, oh, you know. <laughs> okay, fine, you know. Because nobody feels an obligation. That's why, when, that's why there's a billion dollar Pesach hotel industry, you know? Because my parents made Pesach. Everybody I knew when I was growing up made Pesach. You cleaned up the house and you bought food and you cooked it and you served it, you made a Seder. And that was called Pesach and everybody made Pesach. Today, Pesach, how am I gonna make Pesach? I have to clean the house, I have to buy food, ah! Let's go away. <laughs> we could take the whole family away for only $35,000. And besides, I deserve a vacation. I'm so exhausted from having to get off the couch, you know? <laughs> I'm getting a carpal tunnel from all of the texting, you know? <laughs> so there's, there's no assumptions. All the assumptions that society's been based on that you get married and you build a home and you take care of your children. Have you ever heard a mother say this? I've heard a mother say this. I can't deal with these kids. Could you get them away from me? Just leave me alone. I can't handle this. You know, you're driving me crazy. I just want some time for myself. Can you? My mother never had any time for herself. It wasn't even, it wasn't even a value. Everybody was on top of each other, you know? And I, I went to a relative who had brought me in for a simcha. And he had uh, four kids. And each one had their own room. And me and my wife had to sleep on the pull-out bed in the living room in the middle of everything because no kid could move into another kid's room. You know, chas v'shala, you know? Phil Zach says, when we lived in Rodden, we had only one room. And there was room for everybody and, and company and everybody came to say we had one room. That was the whole house. So we moved to Lakewood to a two-bedroom apartment. There was no room for me. I had to sleep in yeshiva. You know what I mean? Because now we have uh, two bedrooms. <laughs> so there's no room for you. You know, when there was one room, there's room for you. But that's it. Nobody, why should I? So now these people get married. And if we get married, make it clear. We're only getting married for me. And if it works for me. And I'm willing to share with you as much as I have to to get what I want. That's why they'll tell you the most important thing in marriage today is good communication. So you can communicate your needs to make sure that you are getting your needs met. Because I don't feel like I'm getting my needs met. I'm giving, and why is it my problem? Why do I have to do this? Let's face it, the death of marriage is fantasy. It's all fantasy. I'm going to tell you something that my wife hates. She always hated it. I read this in the Jewish press like 20 years ago, and I said it over in a speech. My wife hated it, and she repeats every year how much she hates it, and I always use it because uh, many of my decisions in life have been based on annoying my wife, but uh, that's because, you know, I, I had to do chores. You know, I was one of six boys. We had no gender-appropriate jobs, you know, so I wasn't considered intelligent enough to go into the business, you know, so I would do the shopping and the cooking and the cleaning and the laundry. My wife was raised to be an intellectual. She just had to study and get hundreds, you know. If I, my, my mother would come and say, what are you wasting your time studying? Why aren't you cleaning the kitchen, you know? So it uh, just shows you opposites attract. So, uh, so, you know, so uh, this guy wrote a thing, and he says, it's very interesting. He says, a person comes home, you know, and uh, his wife, you know, is wearing, you know, the ratty robe and the fuzzy slippers, you know, no makeup, and the snood pulled over her head, you know, like one of the seven dwarfs, you know. <laughs> It's got the coffee cup, it's got the stature. <laughs> then they're ready, ready to go out. And the team of professional comes, they do her makeup and her hair and her nails and this and that. And now she's ready. But he's not looking at her because every other wife is also all dressed up. So he's like, wow, everybody's got some good going over there and my schlump. Okay, she got dressed up tonight, but usually she's like a schlump. But everybody else goes home and looks like a schlump also. He says, because we have it reversed. We dress for out there instead of for in here. So then everybody looks at everybody else and they think it's a fantasy. But it's not only that, right? Yankee takes out the garbage. I see him every day taking out the garbage. Why don't you take out the garbage? 
I don't know. Shmuley, he's in the park every Shabbos with his kids. You're sleeping. Why don't you take your kids to the park? You know? Oh, uh, look at Avrami. I saw him uh, in, in, in the supermarket. He was doing the whole shopping. And he was bringing everything back into the house. You don't do the shopping, you know? Have you ever seen this? A couple that's married for like 25 years and they're like the perfect family and then they get divorced? You know? And you're like, wow, what happened? Oh, he was great. He took the kids to the park, you know, and, and he went shopping and then he came home and molested them. You know what I mean? We forgot to mention that part. You know what I mean? You don't know what's going on behind closed doors. Nobody's perfect. My wife got the last one. <laughs> and every guy believes that, by the way. <laughs> My father went bankrupt just around when I was born. My mother said each child brings their own luck. But um, he was sitting at the table. He bought all the old racing forms, and he was trying to figure out a, a system to, to, to win at the horses, you know. And this went on for a few days, and my mother said to him, listen, you got five kids now. You got to support the family. You can't just sit home. He said, I can't do it. He says, then I'll go with you. And she went with my father every day from that point onwards. You know, I only saw my mother at night. She parented long distance, you know. You know, somebody would call up and say, Mommy, hit me. Put him on the phone. I'm going to kill you when I get home. You say, you know, and that was it. And we, and we had to, to a certain, you know, my, my younger brother always says, I was a latchkey kid. I had to come home and raise myself. And, you know, yeah, because my father was falling apart. My mother said, what am I going to do? We have to earn a living. I think that's what Ivan Lerner's dad meant when he said, we were busy just taking care of everything. Unfortunately for many of the people in this room, you were raised by my generation. We never grew up. We didn't have to. Things weren't so desperate for us. Our parents took care of us. When we got married and got divorced, we moved back in with our parents. We left our children there so we could go out and do what we wanted because we couldn't handle these kids, because we can't handle Pesach, we can't handle making Shabbos, we can't handle anything because everything is too much for us. And so we raised a generation of kids who don't feel any obligation whatsoever. But there's no way to get married unless you look at it as a sense of obligation. It's not about me. And that's why people are getting divorced so quickly. Because they walk into a marriage and it's like, whoa. I don't, and this is the phrase I hear all the time when I talk to these young couples where they're getting divorced. I don't need this. I don't have to put up with this. One girl said to me, you know how many guys I went out with? You know what I could have had? You know? I don't have to take this. I don't need this. You know? And, and instead of saying, listen, we have to make this work. We have to work together. You know? So was my father a difficult guy? Sure he was. He gave me marriage advice once when I was married because he hated wasting. You know, he grew up in the Depression. You know, food was a... So my mother would make a brisket for Shabbos and nobody in my house would eat leftovers. You know, God forbid. So uh, she'd be left with a half a brisket First cut brisket, that's expensive, you know. So she would wrap it in two bags and sit at the bottom of the garbage bag. And he would tell me, go, she would tell me, hide it in the bottom of the trash bin, you know. And uh, I was doing this for years, every week. And so my father's talking to me. He says, listen, your mother, she's so loyal. She's so good. You know, listen, I'm not the easiest guy in the world. You know, she's so good to me. But she wastes, gets me crazy, you know. She wraps it up and hides it at the bottom of the garbage can and thinks I don't see it, but I find it every time. <laughs> you know? So you make it work. So nobody's perfect. So you make it work. This is worth getting divorced over? But the answer is because there's one question in dating that nobody asked, and there is no answer to this question. And that's the following. You go out with a nice girl. A nice girl. Go with a nice guy. You know? And everything's more or less there. He's not perfect. She's not perfect. Nobody's perfect. Well, it's pretty good. Looks pretty good. But how do I know the next person I go out with won't be better? There is no answer to that question. So you, you drop number two. And number nine is not as good as number two, but it's pretty solid, pretty good. Not, you know, I, can, I should at least be able to find number two. So number 27, you know, it's okay, you know. Anyway, by the time you're in the old age home, you know, <laughs> you meet the widow, Mrs. Brown, you know, in the next thing, you know, in her walker, you know. Well, you know, she's okay, you know. I was like, but how do I know the next widow? <laughs> <laughs> Finding you zivig is kosher kakriyas yamsuf. A Kurdish baruch who created the heaven and earth. How hard is splitting a sea? That's a big deal? I'll tell you what's hard about it. 
because he says to B'nai Israel, go into the sea. And they're like, but it's a sea. No, <laughs> it looks like a sea, but you go in and you have faith. And so Nachshon says, I have faith. And they said, go ahead, Nachshon, we're right behind you. And the water's up to his waist. And he says, I have faith. And he says, go ahead, Nachshon, you're doing great. And it's up to his neck. And he says, I have faith. They said, keep going, Nachshon. And it's up to his nose. And they say, he's dead. <laughs> and then it splits in half. And everyone says, I knew it all the time. <laughs> Eventually, you're going to have to hold your breath and jump in and hope that you don't drown. There are no guarantees. I'm married to my wife now for 31 years. Thank you very much. <laughs> On our anniversary, she thanked me for 27 of the happiest years of her life. <laughs> As we were married 31, she said the first four, I was like, anyway. <laughs> anyway, married 31 years. People look at us and think, wow, what a wonderful couple, you know, and they're, they're so insane, etc. You know, I, I'm going to take issue with Rory Tatz. We have many deep and meaningful conversations whenever we can get away from the kids, which is, okay, not that often. But we love to talk very, very deep things. And by the way, I never got a second date from anybody, including my wife, because I'm too intense. I don't know how to make small talk. You know how you have to go on a date and make small talk? I don't know how. I don't know how to tell boring color war breakout stories. <laughs> I don't know how to make small talk, you know? I always talk about deep and important ideas, you know? That's, that's the only thing I know how to do, you know? So I would go out with these people. And, you know, because I have personality, they would set me out with these loud, you know, crazy girls who were like dancing on the tables, you know? <laughs> there was one girl, I have to be fair, who wanted to go out with me, and that was, I was very sick, and I really couldn't talk. She had a great time. But, um, <laughs> So I'm very intense. So I went out with my wife. The first date was 11 hours. We spent the last hour analyzing the date. You know, how do you think it was going? So uh, she was also very intense, you know. And uh, she just thought it was, this was just too much for her because she knows that the next day we would get married. So, you know, so she needed a little time to get used to the idea. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, we have deep and meaningful conversations. You know, we're, we build things in this world. We do things. You know, it's an unbelievable thing. And somebody asked me, so your wife is for sure your bashert? I said, I don't know. I don't know. She doesn't have a sticker. What am I supposed to do? Check? <laughs> Put the barcodes, you know? I hope she's my bashert, but I don't know. You'll never know. How do I know this is my bashert? You don't. You'll never know. And you'll live and have children and grandchildren and die, and maybe you married the wrong girl. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> So you make do with what you got. <laughs> there comes a point where you have to take a deep breath and hope. Nobody's perfect. And you go into this marriage with the following attitude. I'm going to make this work. By hell or high water, I'm going to make this marriage work. You know, the person's not perfect, neither am I. We'll work on it. You know, and you don't know. I had this guy, I was doing marriage counseling. The marriage was, I never do marriage counseling because I have no qualifications. But sometimes that's why people come to me, you know. But usually people call me and say, we've been to three therapists, two rabbis, and a Kabbalist, and that's it. We're on our way to base them the right to get. You really can't mess this up, you know. So in almost every case, I was able to save the marriage. But, you know, this one guy had a whole laundry list of complaints, and one of them was his house is such a mess. His house is a wreck, and his house is a mess, everything is messy, you know. I met with them a few times, and then I had to meet with them at my house. And after that, he stopped complaining about his wife. <laughs> We set a standard, <laughs> you know? Because <laughs> that's not what's real important to us. We'd much rather be able to have deep and meaningful conversations and, <laughs> you know, clean off the dining room table, you know what I mean? Or, you know, put the cushions back on the dining room chairs, which became unscrewed and keep pulling off when people were sitting on them, you know? <laughs> create its own entertainment value. But, uh, you know, a person has to go in there and say, okay, fine, so we're gonna work this out. So, so, so she, she's messy, and you know, and I'm, and I'm, and I've got a temper. You know what I mean? And and you know, <laughs> and you have this great thing where one people come from this family where everybody yells. My father always yelled. He always denied it. He says, "I just talk loud." <laughs> what did you leave this over here for? I said, "I didn't." What are you yelling at me for? So I'm not yelling. You're yelling. I don't yell. I talk loud. <laughs> In my wife's family, what they do is, you know, when, when they're angry, they make little sarcastic comments at each other. 
We never do that. We either yell or we hit. You know, that's how we express ourselves. We were six boys, you know? Well, five boys at me, whatever it was. I was, a, I was a sensitive one who used to sit there and hide in my room and read, you know? And I didn't like to have rock fights with the kids down the block, you know what I mean? You know? But, uh, you, know, it, you know, and so I would, get, I would get upset and I would yell and she would stop talking, you know? And then later she'd make little sarcastic comments. And of course, that would just get me more upset and I'd yell somewhere. So we were in this really terrible pattern until we sat down and tried to figure out what's going on here and work to change it. Because it's just not going to work. So, okay. So does that mean, therefore, oh, we have to get divorced because he has a temper and I, I'm passive aggressive and he's passive aggressive and I'm angry and I'm not. Forget about it. So you sit down, you work it out. But it starts from the point of view of responsibility. It's not about me. It's about us building something in this world. So here's the deal. My son, who had an unpleasant time in the yeshivas because he's too smart. They don't know what to do with people who are too smart. So some people who are, who are very smart also know how to keep their mouth shut. My son never mastered that technique. Obviously takes after his mother. And, um, <laughs> and so he was having a hard time. I took him to see Rebecca Shapiro. And he said to him, you're right. The yeshiva world's a disaster and it's terrible problems. And he said a whole bunch of things that I don't think he wants me to repeat in public. Yeah. And so my son said, so what do I do? And he looked at him and said, so what do you do? So you don't have a rabbi, you don't have a yeshiva, you don't have a yeshiva, you don't have a yeshiva, you don't have a mashkech. Become yourself. Build yourself. I don't care if society's crazy. So society's crazy. I told you about my high school. I will tell you the number one high school in Yerushalayim. It's called Chadash. That is for the best families, the best people, and the best kids, and the best everybody. They go to Chadash, you know? So I meet this guy whose daughter goes to Chadash, and he says, you know, where's your daughter? I said, cook. He says, why? And I told him why. And he looked at me, and he sighed, and he said, I wish I had the courage to send my daughter there. But I could get her into Chadash, so why wouldn't I send her there? I said, because it's not the best place for her. I know, but it's the best school. You know how many people I met who don't want to marry the best person? They want to make the best shidduch? I see this all the time. Oh, do you know who this is? you know where they're from? Yeah. Somebody said to me, don't you want your daughter to marry the best guy in Hebron? I said, no. I want my daughter to marry the guy who's going to be the best husband and father. I don't have a yeshiva to leave him. You know what I mean? If he knows how to tell some funny stories, I'll get him a couple of gigs. But that's about it, you know? I don't have anything to leave him. But... but to look for what's going to be best for the person. My first son-in-law, who, like my son, is sick smart, you know, so he was upset when he was, when he was married already. He said to me, you didn't really fire me when I came over. I said, for what? I said, my daughter has to live with you, not me. You know, if she's happy with you, and yeah, I checked into you, you're a nice guy, that's it. I have to make the best shit. I have to go around and tell everybody, you know who my son-in-law is, you know that? You're a nice guy, and you know, he happens to be incredibly talented, you know, in, in every way. But, uh, but, you know, but that wasn't what I was looking for. I was looking for somebody who would appreciate my daughter and want to, you know, live that life together. Does he have chesronos? Sure he does. Does he have milas? Tremendous ones. But you know what the best mile is? He's right for my daughter. Yeah? And my daughter's right for him. Does my daughter have chesronos? Sure. So, if you're not sure how to get past this, because society has changed, that's where everybody is, is setting up this system. We didn't need Shurim and Shalom Bayis. Because who needed Shalom Bayis? You were too busy working. <laughs> we didn't have sh classes in Chinuch. Everyone had a belt. <laughs> you didn't need classes, you know what I mean? You needed classes on how to get married. Because everybody got married. A friend of mine said to me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm married 31 years. He's also about 30 years. He says, I know when I got married, everyone got married. If you were tall, if you were short, if you were fat, if you were thin, if you were pretty, if you were ugly, if you were rich, if you were poor, everybody got married. Because everybody got married and everyone understood that that's what you do. And so everybody has to say to themselves, if I'm looking for perfection, if I'm looking for somebody who doesn't need marriage, if I'm looking for somebody who's a finished product, well, you know, wait till you get to the old age home and see who's there. <laughs> but if you find a nice person and they're not perfect and nobody's perfect, you know, and everybody has shortcomings, and you're willing to say, I'm going to invest in this marriage, I'm going to invest in this home, then Rabbi Myers is saying, we'll give you the help to be able to figure out you know, what you can handle and what you can't to get you over that particular hump. That's why we're here tonight. 
and a mirza Hashem in the schus of the hishtadlis. Well, you came here tonight and sat through three speeches. I was here also at the beginning. I also sat through all the speeches. You know what I mean? You know, and, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a long evening, you know? And, uh, and the fact of the matter is that we made this established and that's schus. And with the schus of Rabbi Myers, you know, giving us these tools to be able to help us, all of us should be zoichet to be able, who are still looking for it, to find our shidduch. And those of us who are married should all have the schus to be able to build our home into an emesabais namabisam. <laughs>